Chapter One, The Cursed Crow. Winter of Eleven, three days earlier. The kitchen cat was dead and Morrigan was to blame. She didn't know how it had happened or when. She thought perhaps she'd eaten something poisonous overnight. There were no injuries to suggest a fox or a dog attack. Apart from a bit of dried blood at the corner of his mouth, he looked like he was sleeping, but he was cold and stiff. When she found his body in the weak winter morning light, Morrigan crouched down beside him in the dirt, a frown creasing her forehead. She stroked his black pelt from the top of his head to the tip of his bushy, bushy tail. Sorry, kitchen cat, she murmured. Morrigan thought about where best to bury him and whether she should ask grandmother for a bit of nice linen to wrap him up. Probably best not to, she decided. She'd use one of her own nightshirts. Cook opened the back door to give yesterday's scraps to the dogs and was so startled by Morrigan's presence she nearly dropped her bucket. The old woman peered down at the dead cat and set her mouth in a line. Better his war than mine, praise be to the divine, she muttered, knocking on the wooden doorframe and kissing the pendant she wore around her neck. She glanced sideways at Morrigan. I like that cat. So did I, said Morrigan. Oh yes, I can see that. There was a bitter note in her voice and Morrigan noticed she was backing away inch by wary inch. Go on now inside, they're waiting for you in his office. Morrigan hurried into the office, hovering for a moment near the door from the kitchen to the hallway. She watched Cook take a piece of chalk and write Kitchen Cat Dead on the blackboard at the end of a long list that recently included Spoiled Fish, Old Tom's Heart Attack, Floods in North Prosper and gravy, gravy stains on best tablecloth. I can recommend several excellent child psychologists in Greater Jackalfax area. The new caseworker hadn't touched her tea and biscuits. She travelled two and a half hours from the capital by rail that morning and walked from the train station to Crow Manor in a wretched drizzle. Her wet hair was plastered to her head, her coat soaked through. Morrigan was struggling to think of a better remedy for this misery than tea and biscuits, but the woman didn't seem interested. I didn't make the tea, said Morrigan, if that's what you're worried about. The woman ignored her. Dr Fielding is famous for his work with cursed children. I'm sure you've heard of him. Dr Llewellyn is also highly regarded, if you'd like a gentler, more maternal approach. Morrigan's father cleared his throat uncomfortably. <clears throat> that won't be necessary. Corvus had developed a subtle twitch in his left eye that only appeared during these mandatory monthly meetings, which signalled to Morrigan that he hated them as much as she did. Coal black hair and crooked noses aside, it was the only thing father and daughter had in common. Morrigan has no need of counsel, he continued. She's a sensible enough child. She's well acquainted with her situation. The caseworker chanced a fleeting look at Morrigan, who was sitting beside her on the sofa and trying not to fidget. These visits always dragged. Chancellor, without wishing to be indelicate, time is short. Experts all agree we're entering the final age of this year, the final year before eventide. Morrigan looked away, out of the window, casting around for a distraction as she always did when someone mentioned the E word. You must realise this is an important transitional period, but have you the list? Corvus said with a hint of impatience. He looked pointedly at the clock on his office wall. Uh, of, of course. She drew a piece of paper from her folder, trembling only slightly. The woman was doing rather well, Morrigan thought, considering this was just her second visit. The last caseworker barely spoke above a whisper and would have considered it an invitation to disaster to sit on the same piece of furniture as Morrigan. Shall I read it aloud? It's quite short this month. Well done, Miss Crow, she said stiffly. Morrigan didn't know what to say. She couldn't really take credit for something she didn't control. We'll start with the incidents requiring compensation. The Jackalfax Town Council has requested 700 cred for damage to a gazebo during a hailstorm. I thought we'd agreed that extreme weather events could no longer be reliably attributed to my daughter, said Corvus, after that forest fire in Ulf turned out to be arson, remember? Yes, Chancellor. However, there's a witness who has indicated that Morrigan is at fault in this case. Who? Corvus demanded. A man who works at the post office her overheard Miss Crow remarking to her grandmother on the fine weather Jackalfax had been enjoying. The caseworker looked at her notes. 
The hail began four hours later. Corvus sighed heavily and leaned back in his chair, shooting an irritated look at Morrigan. Very well, continue. Morrigan frowned. She'd never in her life remarked about the fine weather Jackalfax had been enjoying. She did remember turning to grandmother in the post office that day and saying, hot, isn't it? But that was hardly the same thing. A local man, uh, Thomas Bratchett, died of a heart attack recently. He was our gardener. Yes, I know, Corvus interrupted. Terrible shame. The hydrangeas have suffered. Morrigan, what did you do to the old man? Nothing. Corvus looked sceptical. Skeptical. Nothing. Nothing at all. She looked for a moment. Uh, I, I told him the flower beds looked nice. When? About a year ago. Corvus and the caseworker exchanged a look. The woman sighed quietly. His family is being extremely generous in the matter. They ask only that you pay his funeral expenses, put his grandchildren through university and make a donation to his favourite charity. How many grandchildren? Five. Tell them I'll pay for two. Continue. The headmaster at Jackalfax. Ah! The woman jumped as Morrigan leaned forward to take a biscuit, but seemed to calm down when she realised there was no intention to make physical contact. Uh, <clears throat> yes, um, the headmaster at Jackalfax Preparatory School has finally sent us the bill for the fire damage. 2,000 cred ought to cover it. It's said in the newspaper that the dinner lady left the stovetop on overnight, said Morrigan. You're correct, said the caseworker, her eyes fixed firmly on the paper in front of her. It also said that she passed Crow Manor the previous day and spotted you in the grounds. So? She said you made eye contact with her. I never did. Morrigan felt her blood begin to rise. That fire wasn't her fault. She'd never made eye contact with anyone. She knew the rules. The dinner lady was fibbing to get herself out of trouble. It's all in the police report. She's a liar. Morrigan turned to her father, but he refused to meet her gaze. Did he really believe she was to blame? The dinner lady admitted she'd left the stovetop turned on. The unfairness of it made Morrigan's stomach twist into knots. She's lying! I never... That's quite enough from you, Corvus snapped. Morrigan slumped down in her chair, folding her arms tight across her chest. Her father cleared his throat again and nodded at the woman. You may forward me the bill. Please finish the list. I have a full day of meetings ahead. The, 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 that's all on the, on the financial side of things, she said, tracing a line down the page with a trembling finger. There are only three apology letters for Miss Crow to write this month. One to a local woman, Mrs. Calpernica Mowloff, for her broken hip. Far too old to be ice skating, Morrigan muttered. One to Jackal Fatch Jam Society for, ruin, for a ruined batch of marmalade. And one to a boy named Pip Gilcrest, who lost the Great Wolfacre State Spelling Bee last week. Morrigan's eyes doubled in size. All I did was wish him luck. Precisely, Miss Crow, the caseworker said as she handed the list to, Cor to Corvus. You should have known better. Chancellor, I understand you're on the hunt for another new tutor. Corvus sighed. My assistants have spoken to every agency in Jackalfax and some as far away as the capital. It would seem our great state is in the throes of a severe private tuition drought. He raised one dubious eyebrow. What happened to Miss... Uh, the caseworker consulted her notes. Linford, was it? Last time we spoke, you said she was working out nicely. Feeble woman, Corvus said with a sneer. She barely lasted a week. Just left one afternoon and never returned. Nobody knows why. This wasn't true. Morrigan knew why. Miss Linford's fear of the curse prevented her from actually sharing the same room with her student. It was a strange and undignified thing, Morrigan felt, to have someone shout gromish verb conjugations at you from the other side of a door. Morrigan had grown more and more annoyed until she'd finally stuck a broken pen through the keyhole, put her mouth over the end of it and blown back ink all over Miss Linford's face. She was prepared to admit it wasn't her most sporting moment. At the registry office, we have a short list of teachers who are amenable to working with cursed children. A very short list, said the caseworker with a sharp shrug. But perhaps there will be someone who... Corvus held up a hand to stop her. I see no need. I beg your pardon? You said yourself it's not long until eventide. Well, yes, but it's still a year away. Nonetheless, waste of time and money at this age, isn't it? 
Morrigan glanced up, feeling an unpleasant jolt at her father's words. Even the caseworker looked surprised. With respect, Chancellor, the Registry Office for Cursed Children doesn't consider it a waste. We believe education is an important part of every childhood. Corvus narrowed his eyes. Yet paying for an education seems rather pointless when this particular childhood is about to be cut short. Personally, I think we should never have bothered in the first place. I'd be better off spending my hunting dogs I'll be better off sending my hunting dogs to school. They've got a longer life expectancy and are more useful to me. Morrigan ex exhaled a short blunt ooh as though her father had just thrown a very large brick at her stomach. There it was. The truth she'd kept squashed down, something she could ignore but never forget. The truth that she and every cursed child knew deep in their bones had tattooed on their hearts. I am going to die on eventide night. I'm sure my friends in the Winter Sea Party would agree with me, Corvus continued glaring at the caseworker, obliv oblivious to Morrigan's unease, particularly the ones who control the funding of your little department. There was a long silence. The caseworker looked sideways at Morrigan and began to gather her belongings. Morrigan recognised the flash of pity that crossed the woman's face and she hated her for it. Very well, I will inform the ROCC of your decision. Good day, Chancellor, Miss Crow. The caseworker hurried out of the office without a backward glance. Corvid, Corvus pressed a buzzer on the desk and called for his assistance. Morrigan rose from her chair. She wanted to shout at her father, but instead her voice came out trembling and timid. Sh should I do as you like, Corvus snapped, shuffling through the papers in his desk. Just don't bother me. Dear Mrs Maloof, I'm sorry you don't know how to ice skate properly. No, uh, I'm sorry you thought it was a good idea to go ice skating, even though you're a million years old and have brittle bones that could snap in a light breeze. Oh, no. I'm sorry I broke your hip. I didn't mean to. I hope you're recovering quickly. Please accept my apologies and get well soon. Yours sincerely, Miss Morrigan Crow. Sprawled on the floor of the second sitting room, Morrigan rewrote the last few sentences neatly on a fresh sheet of paper and tucked it into an envelope, but didn't seal it. Partly because Corvus would want to check the letter before it was sent, and partly on the off chance that her saliva had the power to cause sudden death or bankruptcy. The click-clack of hurried footsteps in the hallway made Morrigan freeze. She looked at the clock on the wall. Midday. It could be Grandmother, home from morning tea with her friends, or her stepmother, Ivy, looking for someone to blame for a scratch on the silverware or a tear in the curtains. The second sitting room was usually a good place to hide. It was the glummest room in the house with hardly any sunshine. Nobody liked it except for Morrigan. The footsteps faded. Morrigan let out the breath she'd been holding. Reaching over to the wireless, she turned the little brass knob through the squealing, static-filled airwaves until she found a station broadcasting the news. The annual winter dragon call continues in the northwest corner of Great Wolfacre this week, with over 40 rogue reptiles targeted by the Dangerous Wildlife Eradication Force. The DWEF has received increased reports of dragon encounters near Deep Down Falls Resort and Spa, a popular holiday destination for... Morrigan let the newsreader's posh nasal voice drone in the background as she began her next letter. Dear Pip... I'm sorry you thought treacle was spelt with a K. No. <clears throat> I'm sorry you're an idiot. No. <sighs> I'm sorry to hear you lost your recent spelling bee because you're an idiot. <clears throat> Please accept my deepest apologies for any trouble I may have caused you. I promise I'll never wish you luck again, you ungrateful little... No. <clears throat> Yours faithfully, Morrigan Crow. There were now people on the news talking about the homes they'd lost in the Prosper floods, crying over pets and loved ones they'd seen washed away when streets ran like rivers. Morrigan felt a stab of sadness and hoped Corvus was right about the weather not being her fault. Dear Jackalfax Jam Society, sorry, but don't you think there are worse things in life than marmalade? Oh, no. Up next, could Eventide be closer than we think? Asked the news raider. Morrigan grew still. The E word again. While most experts agree we've one more year until the current age ends, a small number of fringe chronologists believe we could be celebrating the eve of eventide much sooner than that. Have they cracked it or are they just crackpots? 
A tiny chill crept along the back of Morrigan's neck, but she ignored it. Crackpots, she thought defiantly. But first, more unrest in the capital today as rumours of an imminent wonder shortage continue to spread, the nasal newsreader continued. A spokesperson for Squall Industries publicly addressed concerns at a press conference this morning. The man's voice spoke softly over the background hum of murmuring, jur murmuring journalists. There is no crisis at Squall Industries. Rumours of an energy shortage in the Republic are entirely false. I cannot stress that enough. Speak up, someone yelled in the background. The man raised his voice a little. <clears throat> the Republic is full of wonder, as it has ever been, and we continue to reap the rewards of this abundant natural resource. Mr Jones, a reporter called out, will you respond to the reports of mass power outages and malfunctioning wondrous technology in the states of Southlight and Far East Sang? Is Urza Squall aware of these problems? Will he emerge from his reclusive lifestyle to address the problem publicly? Mr Jones cleared his throat. <clears throat> Again, these are no more than silly rumours and fear-mongering. Our state-of-the-art monitoring systems show no wonder scarcity and no malfunction of wondrous devices. The National Rail Network is operating perfectly, as are the Power Grid and the Wondrous Healthcare Service. As for Mr Squall, he is well aware that as the nation's sole provider of wonder and its byproducts, Squall Industries has a great responsibility. We are as committed as ever... Mr Jones, there's been speculation as to whether the wondrous shortages could have anything to do with cursed children. Can you comment? Morrigan dropped her pen. I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure... I'm not sure what you mean, stammered Mr Jones, sounding taken aback. The reporter continued. Well, Southlight and Far East Sang, between them, have three cursed children listed on their estate registered. registers, unlike the state of Prosper, which has no cursed children at present and has remained untouched by wonder shortages. Great Wolfacre also has a registered cursed child, the daughter of prominent politician Corvus Crow. Will it be the next state hit by this crisis? Once again, there is no crisis. Morrigan groaned and turned off the wireless. Now she was being blamed for something that hadn't even happened yet. How many apology letters would she have to write next month? Her hand began to cramp at the thought. She sighed and picked up her pen. Dear Jackalfax Jam Society, sorry about the marmalade. Yours, M. Crow. Morrigan's father was the Chancellor of Great Wolfacre the largest of four states that made up the Wintersea Republic. He was very busy and important and usually still working even on the rare occasions he was home for dinner. On his left and right would sit left and right, his ever-present assistants. Corvus was always firing his assistants and hiring new ones, so he'd given up learning their real names. Send a memo to General Wilson, right? He was saying when Morrigan sat at the table that evening. Across from her sat her stepmother, Ivy, and way down at the other end of the table was Grandmother. Nobody looked at Morrigan. His office will need to submit a budget for the new field hospital by early spring at the latest. Yes, Chancellor, said Wright, holding up a blue fabric samples. And for the new upholstery in your office? Oh, the Cerulean, I think. Talk to my wife about it. She's the expert on that sort of thing, aren't you, darling? Ivy smiled radiantly. The periwinkle, dearest, she said with a tinkling, breezy laugh, <laughs> to match your eyes. Morrigan's stepmother didn't look like she belonged at Crow Manor. Her spun gold hair and sun-kissed skin, a souvenir from the summer she just spent de-stressifying on the glorious beaches of South East Prosper, were out of place amongst the midnight black hair and pale, sickly complexions of the Crow family. Crows never tanned. Morrigan thought perhaps that was why her father liked Ivy so much. She was nothing like the rest of them. Sitting in their dreary dining room, Ivy looked like an exotic artwork he'd brought back from holiday. Left! Any word from Camp 16 on the measles outbreak? Contained, sir, but they're still experiencing power shortages. How often? Once a week, sometimes twice. There's discontent in the border towns. In Great Wolfacre, are you certain? Nothing like the rioting in South Lys... Nothing like the rioting in South Light Slum, sir. Just low-level panic. And they think it's due to wonder society, wonder scarcity. Nonsense. We're not having any problems here. Crow Manor has never functioned more smoothly. Look at those lights. Bright as day. Our generators must be full to the brim. Yes, sir, said Left, looking uncomfortable. That hasn't gone unnoticed by the public. Oh, whinge, 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 croaked a voice from the opposite end of the table. 
Grandmother was dressed formally for dinner as usual in a long black dress with jewels around her neck and on her fingers. Her coarse steel grey hair was piled in a formidable bun atop her head. I don't believe there is a wonder shortage, just freeloaders who haven't paid their energy bills. I wouldn't blame that, Ez that Ezra squall if he'd cut them off. She sliced her steak into tiny bloody pieces as she spoke. Clear tomorrow's schedule, Corvus told his assistants. I'll pay the board of town to visit, a visit, do a bit of handshaking, and I'll shut them up. Grandmother gave a mean laugh. <laughs> it's their heads that will need shaking. You have a spine, Corvus. Why don't you use it? Corvus's face turned sour. Morrigan tried not to smile. She'd once heard a maid whisper that Grandmother was a savage old bird of prey dressed up as a lady. Morrigan privately agreed but found she rather enjoyed the savagery when it wasn't aimed at her. It's, uh, it's big day tomorrow, sir, said Left. You're expected to make a speech for the local eligible children. Good Lord, you're right. Nope, thought Morrigan as she spooned carrots onto her plate. He's left. <laughs> what a bother. I don't suppose I can cancel again this year. Where and when? The town hall midday, said Wright. Children from St Christopher's School, Mary Henwright Academy and Jackalfax Prep will attend. Fine, Corvus sighed unhappily, but call the Chronicle. Make sure they have some covering it. Make sure they have someone covering it. Morrigan swallowed a mouthful of bread. What? Big, uh, what's big day? As often happened when Morrigan spoke, everyone turned to face her with vague looks of surprise, as though she were a lamp that had suddenly grown legs and started tap dancing across the room. There was a moment of silence and then, perhaps we could invite the charity schools to the town hall, her father continued, as though nobody had spoken. Good publicity doing things for the underclass. Grandmother groaned. Corvus, for goodness sake, you only need one idiot child to pose for a photo and you'll have hundreds to choose from. Just pick the most photogenic one, shake its hand and leave. There's no need to complicate things. Hmm, he said, nodding. Quite right, mother. Pass the salt, would you, left? Wright cleared his throat timidly. <clears throat> Actually, sir, perhaps it's not such a bad idea to include the less privileged schools. It might get us a front page. Your approval rating in the backwards could do with a boost, added left as he scuttled down the table to fetch the salt. No need to be delicate, left. Corvus lifted an eyebrow and glanced sideways at his daughter. My approval rating any everywhere could do with a, bo a boost. Morrigan felt the tiniest tremor of guilt. She knew her father's major challenge in life was trying to maintain his grip on the affections of great wolfakers voting public while his only child brought about their every misfortune. That he was enjoying his fifth year as state chancellor despite such a handicap was a daily miracle to Corvus Crow, and the question of whether he could sustain this implausible luck for another year was daily anxiety. But mother's right, let's not overcrowd the event, he continued. Find another way to get me on a front page. Is it an auction? asked Morrigan. Auction? Corvus snapped. What the devil are you talking about? Big day. Oh, for goodness sake. He made a noise of impatience and turned back to his papers. Ivy, explain. Big day, began Ivy, drawing herself up importantly, is the day when children who've completed preparatory school will receive their educational bid, should they be lucky enough. Or rich enough, added grandmother. Yes, Ivy continued, looking mildly put out by the interruption. If they are very bright or talented, or if their parents are wealthy enough to bribe someone, then some respectable person from a fine scholarly, scholarly institution will come to bid on them. Does everyone get a bid? Morrigan asked. Heavens no, Ivy laughed, glancing at the maid who'd come to place a tureen of gravy on the table. She added in an exaggerated whisper, if everyone were educated, where would servants come from? But that's not fair, Morrigan protested, frowning as she watched the maid scurry from the room, red-faced. And I don't understand, what, what are they bidding for? For the privilege of overseeing the child's education, Corvus interrupted impatiently, waving a hand in front of his face as though trying to brush the conversation away. The glory of shaping the young minds of tomorrow and so on. Stop asking questions, it's nothing to do with you. Left, what time is my meeting with the chairman and the of the farming commission on Thursday? Three o'clock, sir. Can I come? Corvus blinked repeatedly, a frown deepening the lines in his forehead. Why would you want to attend my meeting with the chairman of... To big day, I mean, tomorrow, the ceremony at Town Hall. You, her stepmother said, go to a big day ceremony. 
Whatever for? I just... Morgan pa Morrigan paused, suddenly unsure. Well, it is my birthday this week. It could be my birthday present. Her family continued to stare blankly, which confirmed Morrigan's suspicions that they'd forgotten she was turning 11 the day after tomorrow. I thought it might be fun, she trailed off, looking down at her plate and dearly wishing she hadn't opened her mouth at all. It's not fun, sneered Corvus. It's politics. And no, you may not. Out of the question. Ridiculous idea. Morrigan sank down on her chair, feeling deflated and foolish. Really, what had she expected? Corvus was right. It was a ridiculous idea. The crows ate their dinner in tense silence for several minutes until... Actually, sir, said Wright in a tentative voice. Corvus's cutlery clattered onto his plate. He fixed his assistant with a menacing stare. What? Well, well, if you were, and I'm not saying you should, but if you were to take your daughter along, it might help to, uh, to uh, soften your image to a degree. Left wrung his hands. Sir, I, I think right is, um, right. Corvus glowered and left rushed on nervously. Well, what, what I mean is, according to the polls, the people of Great Wolfacre see you as a bit, uh, remote, aloof interjected right. It couldn't hurt your approval rating to remind them that you're about to become a, a, a grieving father. From a journalistic point of view, it might give the event a unique uh, point of interest. How unique? Front page unique. Corvus was silent. Morrigan thought she saw his left eye twitch.